Well, at the Seventy Christian Fellowship I go to yesterday morning, they were reading Leviticus 26, and they got, you know, from about verse 16 onwards, somewhere around there, it starts to go through what God will do if they, if the Hebrew people do not love him, do not keep his commandments. And it's horrendous. I mean, it's... Well, as I read it, it's all possible evils that could come upon a person. And I, at some point, I just felt I had to say to the fellowship, I find, scripture or not, this is an appalling account. And I object because it gives God such a a misrepresentation of, I didn't say quite those words, I said something like, it gives him such a bad name. I mean, I'm not sure what I said, but it's just appalling to ascribe this to God. I know it's written in scripture, but I can't run with it. I just can't. Well, of course, I've already told them the previous week, I can't see Jesus stoning someone blasphemy. I mean, I just cannot see that. That's what's <laughs> told to do. They were commanded to do, supposedly, in, in the Old Testament scripture and so on. But I do agree. I mean, I just held my ground. No one argued against me. Not a single person said, well, no Marshall or something, you know. They just listened. I suppose they listened because they knew I was speaking it from the heart. They may have, some of them felt, well, he's wrong. But they didn't want to force a correction upon me, and I was incredibly impressed with that. Despite their fundamentalism, their legalism, as I see it, they just held their peace. And I think lovingly, too. It's a strange thing, because I've been there a long time, longer than all of them, really, or nearly. And um, they have a respect for that. Or, or, I, I, I want to say something nicer than that. They have a kindness for me because of a relationship in some sense that they feel to me. They know I speak out what's in my heart, despite the fact that, that I know it doesn't match with theirs, and I'm not speaking it out to hurt them. They know that. I'm not against them. I'm anything but against them. And I think they know that. But of course, wittingly or unwittingly, they did spend the rest of the study. Well, it amounted to a defense of their position. First of all, that they didn't feel that they were legalists. <laughs> and, and one lady there, she's a sweetheart. I mean, she's an older lady and she doesn't present as a sweetheart. She presents as a fairly dominant, capable lady. Um, <laughs> and um, she said, well, if you get stopped by um, a traffic cop and he says you were doing 120 in 100 area uh, and... Um, there's no point in saying to him, well, you're just being legalistic about this. <laughs> because, of course, that is the law. Legalism, is, it's the law. You know? So, I mean, I like that. Because, I mean, can you imagine arguing with a traffic cop? Like, well, don't be legalistic, mate. I mean, I'm sure I was doing more than the legal limit, but what's that going to do with it? <laughs> Wouldn't get you far with it. But, you know, I mean, that's not really, a, it's not meant to be a full limit. Of, um, well, it might be uh, of, their, of their position, but um, 
well, I laughed the way, of course, because I, I thought, put beautifully, and I mean, in a sense, I don't know if they realise it, but it's skillful, yes, I think they do, a skillful use of um, debate and uh, uh, study and analysis, isn't it? A rhetoric, I think we ought to call it, uh, ability to neatly say the right thing to absolutely, um, you know, nip the thing dead on. That. And then, well, they talked through one way and another, and that I so heartily agree with and did agree with, that, you know, even in the Old Testament, there was always the possibility of repentance. All you had to do was turn. All you had to do was sacrifice in those days, make the appropriate sacrifice. Come back to doing your best to keep the principles or commandments as they see it. There was compassion, you see, there was the way out always. I mean, I pointed out in my objection, you know, um, early on that in my objection, I held forth for about two minutes. Um, perhaps, yeah, probably two and a half minutes. That um, the Jewish people, or they, I'd imagine, said they, meaning Hebrew Jews, or not, have had, you know, millennium, I mean, um, thousands of years of suffering appallingly. And of course I'm appealing to the heart, aren't I? I'm saying you, you can't you can't live with that part of chapter twenty six of Leviticus sixteen onwards and so on. The, even the Holocaust was just the tip of the iceberg of what they have suffered. I mean are you going to attribute this to this, you know, almost vengeance of God for not keeping his rules? It, it, it maligns my God something terrible. I just, I object, is what I'm saying. I, I'm not, I don't mean I'm accusing them. I'm just objecting and saying this is, I know it's in scripture, but I can't live with that. It, 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 it's an offence to my love of God, who I see him as. I expect they think, well, yes, I expect you do see him that way, and <laughs> it's the wrong way of seeing him. <laughs> but, you know. But I think, on reflection, what I'm really impressed with is the group there, about 19 people, in, came across as, well, they reacted in a way that's consistent with listening to me, accepting what I'm saying, without taking on as their view necessarily, of course, but accepting it kindly. Um, what we would call a fellowship love, they did not reject me because of it. Wow. Not as legalist as I was seeing them in some months back, eh? Yeah, I love them. Love them. Love them. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you, Heavenly Father. So, it was a very blessed meeting and fellowship with, our, after them, with them afterwards. Nobody coming up to me, putting me right or something, you know. Just accepted in fellowship, this is. Okay, this is Marshall. Somehow it's okay. They know I accept them, you see. I accept them as they present. Well, more than that, I always accept people deeper than they present. Wow.
my desire is to love. My desire is to love them. And my desire is for that reality to come across to them. And I think it has. So it was a lovely meeting. Thank you, Heavenly Father. And I'd like to say in passing that, um, I mean, it is interesting, isn't it, that there was always the possibility of putting things right. I mean, as the story runs in the Old Testament, I don't mean it's all historical reality. They see it as such, of course, and I don't want to trample on them in that regard. Um, but I see it as a story, a scripture story. Blessing, its validity is in its validity, not in its history or historicity or otherwise. To me, of course, to them, of course, it's absolutely historical fact as well. And I understand that, and uh, I can run with that for their sake. Uh, and, uh, and think and reason in that frame of reference. And in that frame of reference, there is uh, grace. You know, I say grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. But, I mean, and they objected, I know, the other week that no, no, I mean, that's in the Old Testament as well. It's not just in when Jesus came. There was, you know, the sacrifice and that is to say there is forgiveness if you repent and, and turn and want to. And after all, even if you read down John, uh, sorry, Leviticus 26, I mean, the earlier part makes it clear that if you're running with the principles, you're blessed. And it's only if not, um, I will appoint these things, it says in there, that God will appoint all this evil and curse and so on. But, you know, coming back into my understanding and frame of reference, we are in this very universe appointed with both good and evil that we may learn thereby and come into life eternal as a consequence of this schooling here. And in a sense, yes, he does appoint the evil, but as a blessing. Now that's extremely hard to follow when you're up against horrendous evil to say this is appointed by God. Um, because you've got to the point where well, you're just, if you like, frightened by the evil. And you can't see God for the intensity of the evil and the harm. But it presents, doesn't it, the possibility of you crying out to God and recognizing how much you are against evil and therefore your willingness to do all goodness that brings goodness. And perhaps not all but many in such, push to such limit, do come through and, but perhaps all, I mean all in my understanding, because he's a perfect, all powerful God, has no mistakes, can do all things, loves you, loves all he's made. They don't have that view, of course, they, they have the view, well, sometimes and they go to hell and, I think they see hell as eternal. I don't think they can, well, I don't think they, I don't know if the Catholics, I don't know what the Catholics do. 
They certainly didn't see purgatory as eternal. It was a time of difficulty and suffering, and then um, you would come through to the heaven to life eternal. Um, yeah. As is the shrine, so is the worshipper. You can tell who a person is by what they are worshipping. Because what they are worshipping is what they value. Hmm. So, thank you, Dad. Oh, well, what they're worshipping is what they love if they chosen to worship it, of course, if it been prevailed upon, forced to worship. <laughs> well, that's a bit different. They probably are aware that they still have their view of God, but are forced to um, worship, you know, this particular view of God that's being forced on them. So then that would be different, wouldn't it? Mm. And uh, another point I'd like to pick up on is... Um, uh, I see the New Testament, well, I see um, World of Uncertainty as a classroom. And uh, all being rescued ultimately into life, all graduating perfectly eventually. Because, you know, the principle of, uh, to me, is an all-powerful God and all-loving and therefore has no mistakes and and achieves um, perfectness, which is for all. You know, the all is part of the perfectness. All that he's made, all that he's loved, and he's made all, and he's all powerful. Well, that's my ideal. Now, it's not everybody's not quite that anyway. I mean, bits of it they agree with, but they don't necessarily follow through on what I think that implies. And therefore... Uh, both earnest people following Jesus in the New Testament say, um, still feel some people never make the grade uh, with whatever consequence they therefore assume upon such people. And the more so those that, well, essentially are uh, very concerned to be believing in the Torah as well, that um, it doesn't, it doesn't s say there that all people are, are saved, and in fact, in a sense, quite the reverse. I mean, the rest of the non-believers in the world, um, uh, you know, will come and worship uh, the Old Testament view and the Revelation view. But they're in some sense still be outside the city, um, you know, the New Jerusalem in terms of the Book of Revelation. There are people that are not, not fully into the loveliness this experience by the citizens of Jerusalem. Um, in such view, it's not my view, but as is the God, sorry, as is the shrine, so is the worshiper. Not entirely true, that saying, of course, because your shrine, as we've said here, might be forced upon you, may not be you your shrine of choice. And what we're really saying is, or well, what I've been saying is, you should worship your God, your shrine of choice, for all it's worth, for all your heart, soul, mind and strength, and quickly find out how to uh, adjust that view to what's revealed to you as being more truly your God. Bless you. Thank you, Dad.